Hello, everyone, again. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you were here earlier, you saw us on the legal panel. If you are just getting here, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into kind of the nitty gritty of the legal requirements for if you want to do a crowdfunding raise. So as you can see, we've kind of legal and financial requirements, which we seem to be kind of the most important and difficult hurdles for a crowdfunding raise. Um, so with that, let's get started. Thank you, Zach. Uh, my name is Jonathan Reyes. I am the Director of Compliance and Due Diligence at Start Engine, and we have Kristen Howell over here, partner at Fox Rothschild. Um, my, my background is mostly in regulation crowdfunding, which is kind of up to a million. So she, uh, Kristen has more expertise on the Reg A Plus, so we'll kind of, I'll give you the in, uh, perspective on Reg CF, and she'll kind of chime in for where Reg A Plus is different, depending on kind of what you want to do. Okay, so um, this, this presentation is gonna focus on two main types of crowdfunding. Again, if you were here earlier, you may have noticed that there is a third type called uh, Regulation D 506C, which we also offer, which you can raise from accredited investors. That's something that we do, but these are kind of our two core um, offering types. So we're gonna keep it focused on this. If you have questions about the other type, uh, Regulation D, feel free to ask us after the presentation and we can give you more information about that. So giving you a little bit of background information about the crowdfunding regulation and what it allows you to do. Uh, these, are, these are the two main types, as I said. Regulation crowdfunding, we, I would say, is our most frequent type of capital raise. This allows you to raise up to 101.07 million every 12 months. Um, I know that's a weird number. It started at a million and was adjusted for inflation, so that's why it has that strange 0.07. Um, this allows, the big, the big difference with crowdfunding is that this allows you to take investments from anyone, not just accredited investors, which is what it used to be. So that's kind of the large breaking point for regulation crowdfunding. Um, and so this allows you to take investments from anyone, accredited or non-accredited, as long as they're over 18, and allows you to take on an unlimited number of accredited of investors. Um, another kind of consideration for regulation crowdfunding is how much an investor can invest. Um, and so there's two different levels of what you're allowed to invest under Reg CF. It's basically 5%. Uh, if, if your annual income or net worth is under $100,000, then you're allowed to invest 5% of the lower. If your net income or, an, or annual income or net worth is above 100000 then you're allowed to invest up to 10%. So it's kind of a sliding scale and we have the platform set up so you just put in what your annual income and net worth is and it automatically calculates how much you're allowed to invest over the course of the year. Um, and then Reg A Plus um, is up to 50 million. I don't know if you wanna chime in here and give them a little bit of background on it. So Reg A Plus allows you to go much larger. Uh, Actually, most Reg A Plus offerings are actually still pretty small. I think the average maybe has creeped up to seven or nine million, but um, they're still it's still used for for relatively small offerings. Um, and the reason it's still used, even though they're they're fairly small, is that uh, you can take a broad range of types of investors. The shares are freely tradable afterwards. More on that later. Um, and um, and you can have an unlimited number of investors. So it, it does give you more flexibility to go to market and raise a larger amount. Um, and the limitations up there on, on how much people can invest, that's it's a pretty low bar. Uh, and you don't have to certify that. You don't have to have them like give you their bank statements. You can just, they can check a box basically and certify that they're eligible. So that's a pretty low bar for the investors to come in. Okay, so uh, I think another kind of important consideration when you're thinking about these two is how they relate to each other in terms of the time it takes to conduct the offering and kind of the how the process works with the SEC and how much it's going to cost the company who's interested in doing it. So speaking from the regulation crowdfunding side, uh, we say on average that the preparation time ranges anywhere from half a month to three months. If you're extremely motivated and your company has is, has all their documents together, is very organized, is everything is pretty clean, you can. Get, <laughs> I see some no's up here, <laughs> but never, you can. Get, never happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rare instance, but you know it is theoretically possible to get a campaign up within under a week or two weeks. Obviously, that is the outlier and not the norm. Um, but in general, I would say anywhere from half a month to three months is a good ballpark for what you should expect. Um, something. 
uh, that we help out with in, during that process is basically for Reg CF, you're required to file what's called an offering document in a Form C. And this document basically collects all the information that you're required to disclose to investors. It, this will be you know, your business, your owners, your team management, your financials, your company securities, all that kind of stuff. So we've basically built out our platform so that it collects all that information through an onboarding process. And then we kind of help you fix whatever information is wrong and at the end automatically generate that document for you. So you don't have to ha hire a lawyer to prepare the document or anything like that. It's built into the platform. Um, and then in terms of once you've completed that process and the document and your information has been approved, uh, the filing with the SEC under crowdfunding is instant. It's basically a notice filing to put on record with them. They don't have to review the information. They just collect it. And then if something happens at a later date where they have to go back and review it, they have it accessible and they can go see what was reported versus whatever if they get a complaint or something along those lines. Um, in addition, outside of the approval time, the cost uh, in general is much lower, of course, for a Reg CF. It can be done for almost for free if you're motivated and have the know-how um, minus the expense of bad actor checks. Aside from that, you know there are some other minor expenses if you get a little bit more complex, if you need help preparing your financials, if you need help cleaning up your legal. So we say anywhere from 500 to 20,000 is kind of like the range that we see for uh, regulation crowdfunding. Um, and we've got some stats up here for Reg A. I don't know if these track with your experience, but I'll let you talk to those points. They do. The preparation time, uh, in terms of preparing the documents to file with the SEC, it's it's a similar situation. If a company's really ready to go, it actually doesn't have to take very long. But usually they're, they're not. That's, that's where most companies are at when they're going to do their first A-plus offering. So it does take a couple months to get those drafted and filed. And it requires uh, legal counsel and accounting and your executive team to really come together to make that a, a strong offering document. And you also need to be thinking about you know, whether you're going to use a broker to help uh, to bring in especially accredited investors because I think of a Reg A plus as like a, it's, a, it's an accredited investor offering plus non-accredited. You still usually need to be bringing in accredited investors so that you can get enough uh, capital in to make it worthwhile. So, you know, be thinking about, okay, I've got a Keystone investor, you know, with, with uh, he'll put in a million and then another he'll put in half a million and then everybody else is, is crowd and that's awesome because they're our customers or whatever that might be, or our friends and family, but you still need to be thinking about those institutional or angel type investors. And so, anyways, you go through that process, you prepare the documents, uh, working with your executive team and counsel and we file with the SEC. They take about 30 days. Uh, I think last I checked, they were running maybe 40 um, to get comments back. And they're things like, please remove the word and from page one. Um, <laughs> and sometimes more interesting. <laughs> but it's, uh, it can be, it, it's, all, it's, uh, it's almost laughable sometimes. And then you amend and you send it over again and you say, now what? And usually you've got one more round. Uh, if you've got a pretty clean offering, you, you might just have those two rounds. They might be pretty quick and you can get filed. And uh, they declare it effective. Uh, they qualify it. And then you can start closing on your investments. And so three to four months total there is that it is pretty short. Um, it's frankly tends to run longer, especially if you don't have audited financial statements. Even just selecting your auditor, going through that process can delay it meaningfully. So um, we can be looking at you know six to eight months. This really is tailored for CF, but probably kind of overlaps pretty close to Reg A, just with more detail. Um, this is kind of just a collection of the information that is required to disclose to investors when you choose to do a Reg CF offering. Because it's a public offering and you're soliciting money from unaccredited investors who don't have kind of sophistication with investing, you're required to disclose a lot more information than you would if you're doing a private round with sophisticated investors. So the trade-off for getting money from the crowd is that you need to give a lot more information about your business. Um, and in order to do so, like I was mentioning before, basically it comes in the form of uh, what's called a Form C in an offering document. Um, and at a high level, this kind of generally includes the general information about your business, how the business operates, what the product is, what stage of development it's at, who your industry, who are your competitors, that kind of information. 
And then you also have to disclose everyone on the team, specifically what are called covered persons. And this is uh, basically en encompasses directors, officers, executives, or if you're an LLC, managers. Um, and basically you have to do a background check for all those people as well. And then uh, information about your corporate structure. So you know, if you're uh, C-Corp, what classes of stock do you have? Only common stock or preferred stock? How many shares are authorized? How many shares do people own? Who are the main owners? Then you also have to disclose anyone who owns over 20% of the company because basically that's what's considered a control person. They can kind of manage the direction of the company so they are required to disclose who has that ownership. Um, beyond that also, the kind of like key disclosure is the financial statements and the financial highlights. So essentially, you're basically required to have two years of financial statements or since inception if you were formed in less than two years ago. And then you are required to discuss kind of the results within those financial statements and where the company stands in terms of what caused those statements and if you expect them to continue into the future. And then also beyond that, just kind of the terms of the offering, what you're what security you're gonna offer when you try to raise and um, you know how you're gonna use the money, what your valuation is, how you justify that valuation, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think that's kind of high level mostly what it is. I'm not sure if there's anything else in reggae that kind of there's, deviates. There's more and there's definitely more detail, but I think you know in terms of the CF, one of the nice things is it's pretty much what a decently drafted pr private placement memorandum should look like. So, it, you know, it's nothing too shocking there. Um, and and I, you can look online, of course, and see what their, the CF offerings. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of like your investor deck plus. <laughs> so. And if you are interested in seeing what this looks like, basically you can go to any campaign live on our site and click on the terms button and there'll be a link to an offering document. Every offering document is filed with the SEC and is publicly available on the SEC Edgar website. So, you know, ours are all basically come in the same format and you'll see exactly what this looks like from a practical standpoint. Okay, so in terms of if you're starting to think about doing crowdfunding, um, what exactly do you need to get together and what, you know, from a start engine standpoint, what kind of documents do we ask you to provide as well? Um, so we found that if you're going to do it, it's a lot easier to collect a lot of these documents up front prior to starting the process and have everything in one place rather than having to go back and find it piecemeal. Um, so I, I think this probably will differ a little bit from Reg A because the level of diligence required for a Reg CF is lower. But so there's probably more documentation and validating required on a Reg A scale. But for a Reg CF, uh, you're going to need basically your filed articles of incorporation or if you're an LLC, your articles of organization your bylaws, or if you're an LLC, your operating agreement. If you are kind of running your campaign under a name that's different from your corporate name, we request also your fictitious business name filing. Um, proof of the company's EIN. Um, cap table is not required, but is definitely helpful in trying to figure out what you're reporting throughout the company security section. So you know we find when they have those available, that makes the process a lot easier. And then, of course, financial statements. Obviously, you may not have those up front, but it's just something to think about that you're going to need to prepare. And in terms of what's required for those financial statements, we'll kind of go into a bit more depth later. But basically, as I mentioned, it's two years or since inception, if shorter. And there's kind of three tiers of what's required, depending on how much you're going to raise. So if you're only raising up to 107,000, you can prepare them internally and have the CEO sign off that they look accurate. If you want to raise above 107,000, you have to have a CPA provide either a review report or an audit. If it is a your first time ever doing a crowdfunding raise, you can raise up to a million using um, Reg CF. I mean, using a CPA review report. And then if it's your second or further, and you're going over 500, you need a full audit. Um, so that's kind of the requirements for financials. And then those are those are more regulation requirements um, in terms of start engine policies and our due diligence process. Another thing that we look for is basically, if you're going to talk in your campaign about any material relationships or contracts or partners or license or IP arrangements, if it's kind of critical to your campaign, we basically validate that information by requesting that you provide proof in some form. So you know that'll take the form of an actual patent filing or a partnership agreement with someone or licensing agreements. And so for example, this is something like if you talk about having a high profile partner, like um, we're partnering with Coca-Cola, we're gonna ask you to provide that agreement just to validate that that is a true statement. 
And those are kind of like some um, prescribed sources, but basically for us, we will take any validating source that seems reasonable. So even like email correspondence between the other company that kind of shows that there's a relationship or any other kind of reasonable means that you can provide will always evaluate and make a determination if we think that is acceptable. Um, I think that is generally what we request. I don't know if there's anything else that you would suggest. No, I think that's spot on. And I would just add that even though it seems onerous and now it looks like they're the bad guys who are being difficult, this is absolutely for your benefit. Um, it, these are things that will come up later if things go south. And so the fact that you've got them papered now, you've, you've exercised that muscle. You know, you've built the muscle of how do I maintain basic corporate records that I need to have. And also to have, like with counsel, will help you not overstate what you have. Um, it's just good to be transparent and clear. You don't want to overstate, you know, oh, we've got 25 patents pending. And what you really mean is, well, we think we, we can file for 25 patents. Um, I had a, an offering we did, actually, um, where we, uh, a client said they had 25 leases in one particular city for a particular uh, type of thing they were going to do. And we were doing a, an IPO, and the SEC asked for copies of these leases, and we had them, and uh, we sent them. Anyway, it turned out that the leases weren't signed. Uh, they didn't actually have the leases. When we asked for them, they forged the sign, the signatures, and uh, that client actually was arrested by the FBI uh, about 18 months ago. <laughs> so, and that IPO never even proceeded. So, I mean, that, that no one actually was damaged by that filing with the SEC. So that gives you a sense of, you know, it's like this, what they're asking of you is for your own good, to help you not overdo it. Because you're in marketing mode, you're creative, you're, you know, these are not, this is not what you want to focus on. So they're just going to help you focus on it long enough to get things straight so you can go do what you do. I will, <laughs> I will add to that, that while this may seem onerous as you go through the process, in the future when someone comes to you and if you're doing a subsequent capital raise or just, you know, someone wants to work with you and you have all these documents in like a single folder, it just makes the process so much easier. Very helpful. Another uh, important consideration when you're getting ready to crowdfund besides collecting the documents is starting to think about exactly what you want to offer in, in the campaign. This is kind of like the main consideration that is not just part of your business and you just know the answer. It's more you have to determine. From our perspective, this is generally... We generally see two main types, and it's going to be equity and convertible note. We do have some other types that we have done and that are available, but are kind of lesser used and more complex and harder to market, take longer time to get ready. Um, but we'll kind of touch on those as well. So our most common and our easiest offering type, when, as we were saying before, keep it simple, because people just like the company and they're trying to invest in the company, and this is a nice opportunity for them, is a C Corp doing common stock. It's very. It's probably the fastest way to get through the process. Um, you can also do other classes of stock if you have preferred stock or non-voting stock. That becomes a little bit more complex. You need to kind of designate all those different rights that that stock will have in corporate documents, which probably may not be designated prior to the offering. So uh, generally, doing anything that's not common stock will require the help of an attorney, unless you've already kind of structured it to be prepared. But for the most part, that's not the case. Um, for an LLC to do equity, uh, we do it generally in what is called either membership interests or units. This is generally a lot of LLCs that are set up not with the idea of crowdfunding in mind. A lot of the ownership is designated as a percentage. And so we touched on this in the other uh, presentation, but basically you can't really sell a percentage in a crowdfunding raise because you don't know how many people are going to invest. You don't know what your max is going to be, so it's kind of a moving target. So you have to change your LLC to be structured similar to a C-Corp where you're selling units is just kind of like the new terminology rather than stock. Um, and whether you're doing stock or units, kind of the two key determinations are what your pre-money valuation is going to be set at and what your price per share is, which are basically, you know, you set, you choose one, the other is set. They're basically correlated. And whether, if you're, if you're not doing a standard type, if there'll be any special rights. Uh, I think one thing we see pretty frequently is that a lot of companies want to do sh issue shares that are non-voting. Um, it's very frequent because they don't want to have to deal with hundreds of small check investors when it comes to a vote. Generally, it won't be a huge issue because they won't have a majority vote anyway, but there are 
several different avenues to kind of accomplish that feat, whether you do, you create a class of non-voting stock in your articles of incorporation, or you kind of create a proxy voting where you grant, all the investors grant their vote to the CEO. So we have some options to achieve that, but then there's also, if you're doing preferred stock, there are other rights that you can add, things like that. Um, convertible note is the second most common kind of offering we have. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, it's basically a debt instrument that accrues interest, and then at some point, if the company raises capital in the future, or if the way ours is structured, if it hits the maturity date, it will convert into a class of stock of the company uh, with generally a discount to the people that raise money in the next, that the people that invest in the next round. So you don't have to set your terms now, and when you set it in the future, the investors that invest in the note get kind of a discount from those investors. So it's kind of advantageous to get it earlier, so you get a better price and you get more shares. For our site specifically, when you do a convertible note, you need to decide what kind of equity the notes are going to convert into, whether it's going to be common stock or some other class. Um, you need to decide what the discount rate will be for those investors, if they're going to get 80% of the share price rather than 100, what the valuation cap will be, which is like the maximum valuation that it can be at the next raise, and then what the interest rate of your debt will be. Um, this is a little bit different from traditional convertible notes because generally they will convert into whatever type of equity is raised at the next fundraise. Um, but for crowdfunding, uh, you're required to kind of identify the class of stock that investors will get because it's public to non-accredited. So we have an, that additional requirement. Those are the two main types. Um, we have some other types as well. We do some revenue sharing for companies, revenue sharing structured more for movies and entertainment, uh, which we've had plays, plays come through our platform and movies, entertainment properties that's kind of like suited for them. Um, we also do just straight up debt that doesn't convert into uh, stock and it just you get repaid your debt at some point. And then we also have kind of an, our own category of just token related offerings as you may or may not be familiar. Just a lot of, it's basically cryptocurrency being used as a security. Some of it is through equity and then we have other two other types we call rate and date. It's essentially a convertible note or equity plus some sort of token added as a perk of the offering. Um, I think those are really our main types. I don't know if you see any of those. One thing I would just uh, emphasize is, is one of the benefits of the convertible note, especially if you're new, is uh, just a minute, that, that you, uh, where you really don't have a valuation, you really have no idea what your valuation should be. That can be a nice way to just go to market and people don't even have to really test your valuation because really the price will come into play at that next round where they get the discount. It's also nice because then you really maybe can't predict what your next round is going to be priced at and so you can avoid having a down round for your second round. Um, by having this one effectively be unpriced. So I, I do like convertible notes for early stage companies a lot. And so you had a question. We're currently raising on a safe. Mm -hmm. Do you support safes? I'm actually not a fan. I think, you know, they're a lot like a convertible note in that way. Um, the reason I'm not a fan is that if you are then moving to the SEC next, they're wary of them. And, uh, but they're seeing them more and more. Um, but it's just anything that you think you might want to do a an A plus or an IPO down the road. It just makes it a little more complicated. Uh, I will also add to that. Um, we used to do safes. We stopped doing them kind of as a result of a couple different decisions we made internally and guidance we picked up on externally. Um, one was kind of just that, as she said, the SEC has mixed feelings about them, and it's kind of we don't really want to draw any unnecessary scrutiny. Uh, the second being that I think it's really more of an investment vehicle that's kind of targeted for accredited investors. And from a crowdfunding standpoint, it doesn't really afford many protections for kind of unaccredited, non-sophisticated investors. So, you know, if you never do a subsequent raise, there's a possibility that the company goes on to become a $100 million company, but the safe notes themselves never convert. And there's kind of like no built-in protections. So I think as a policy decision, we kind of moved away from those. Uh, when the uh, convertible note converts, is it mandatory or is it voluntary? Um, so for Start Engine specifically, our standard convertible note, this is not the case for all convertible notes and they can kind of be drafted how you want them to, but for ours, it is mandatory and it automatically converts. If there's no qualified financing prior to the maturity date, our notes uh, automatically convert at the maturity date with interest and at the valuation cap. And you yeah. have a question for you. Okay, so if you move from a seed round that does include a safe, 
and you go into a, um, a reg C F. Does can that safe note create issues with the SEC if it was already in place? Not on the CF. And, and a safe isn't illegal, it isn't bad. It's, you know, I don't mean to, <laughs> um, and they're, they're widely used, but they were really designed for venture capital investors, and so they don't translate as well in the SEC. You know, it's one of those things. Some people took advantage of them, used them in an improper way, now they have a bad name. Um, like tokens. Um, <laughs> so, um, but no, it's, it wouldn't prevent you from doing a CF for your next, and depending on the terms of your safe, perhaps actually your safe would be affected by the CF. Uh, yeah, I will follow up on that and say we have had companies raised that had previously done safe notes, so it's fine to have them. It's not like ex exclusion and it won't prevent you from raising with us. It's just we don't offer them through the platform, but certainly as long as you disclose that you have them and what converts them, everything is fine. So for the regulation CF, uh, in terms of equity um, shares, building in a buyback, what, how does that work and when is that um, convertible? Yeah, so for our platform, the way it works is we have kind of a standard agreement and we have a option for special provisions. And uh, basically, if you want to have something that's non-standard, you request a special provision and we'll review it and determine whether it's acceptable or if it's something that's just like taking advantage. But generally, we've had, we've had several buybacks um, and we have kind of default language, I think that the buyback gives you some sort of, generally it's you get a liquidation preference like 1.5 times your money back or whatever you may set it at in the event of either a institutional financing in the future or an IPO or something like that. So it gives the company the option. Is that not a popular, does that turn people away? That, that type of uh, realistically, I would say a lot of the investors that are investing in crowdfunding rounds are less concerned with the terms than they are with the company and the product and the brand. So it's not, I haven't seen it deter too frequently, but you know, some investors care about the terms a lot, just like the company. Some actually like it. I mean, it can actually be a, a positive that you're actually anticipating providing them an exit earlier than they would other, otherwise have. So you can even kind of put it that way that you recognize that this isn't, they don't want to be in it for 20 years, you know, so anyway, it can, it can go either way. If we've got existing convertible notes, is it your recommendation to convert those first before we do this? Is it more appealing? Not necessarily. Um, it, you know, it really depends on your cap table. And that's one thing I was going to mention earlier that I see a lot of folks come to us, they don't really have their cap table laid out, and they also haven't done a pro forma to really look at how this projects out with their revenue and everything. So it would really depend on just how those numbers look. If you can convert now, that's probably beneficial because uh, the price is lower now than it will be in two years, say. So it's often a great thing to convert your notes, but not always. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't offhand know the answer to that, but generally I would say that we get more questions about how they work and what they are. I think everyone kind of conceptually understands stock. Yeah, absolutely. I think an alternative to that really might be preferred stock for a CF, uh, where it's a little less confusing. Um, but the terms can actually mirror. It can, you know, a convertible note and preferred stock can be essentially the same thing with a different name. So. Okay, so I think we're gonna Sorry. we'll come back for questions later at the end. But I want to just get through the whole thing so you guys can get a feel for the process. So, uh, kind of one of the other biggest hurdles when you're getting prepared is the financial statements themselves are something that we see a lot of companies takes the longest time to get ready. So basically, for crowdfunding itself, the SEC requires. Um, the, fo the following statements, it's a, well, there's a CEO sign off or a CPA review report basically certifying that by the company or the CPA that the financials look correct and accurate to the best of their knowledge. And then it requires a balance sheet, uh, income statement, statement of changes in equity and a statement of cash flow and, and the notes to the financial statements for the past two years or since inception. And it all has to be in US GAAP format. Um, and there are some kind of like outlier rules where if the company was formed this year, you may only need a balance sheet, or if you have a new entity, but it's transferred from a previous entity that may qualify as a predecessor. So those are 
things to think about, which we will touch on later. But um, those are the general um, statements, and these are kind of the requirements based on how much you're raising for which ones you need. So 107 or less is just financial statements certified by the principal officer. 107 to 535 for any time you're doing that is what's called a review report by a CPA. And then if you're doing 535 to 107, it depends on whether or not you have raised capital under Reg CF before. If you have never raised capital under Reg CF, so if it's your first time, you can go up to a million using a CPA review report. If it is your second time or more, and you go over 535, you're required to have a CPA audit. And kind of high level, what that means is basically a review is less intensive than an audit, and the price point is probably 20% of an audit. So you can probably get a review report done for a couple thousand, whereas for an audit, you're probably looking at five digits. Um, so I think that's kind of the basic breakdown. And if you guys have any questions about the financial stuff, we can go through that at the end. So. This is very start engine specific, but actually mirrors very closely what she described about the SEC qualification process for getting comments. We take a little bit faster than them, hopefully. But um, so basically, um, once if you're going to raise capital through our platform, once you apply and we review all your criteria to make sure you're eligible, you get assigned to an account manager. At that point, you will work with the account manager to basically complete your onboarding, which is just filling out um, you know, all the different fields and providing the legal documents and getting your financials uploaded, uh, pre preparing your campaign, your team page, all that kind of stuff. Once that's done, you basically submit to the review team, which is the team I'm on, and we take you know, a look at your entire campaign. We basically cross-check all the information within it, make sure that everything's being disclosed properly, that it covers all the required disclosures under the regulations. So basically, we're trying to make sure that you meet the regulatory requirements to raise under the um, the crowdfunding act, um, and so at that point it kind of works the same way. We will generally you'll always have comments. I've never seen anyone get through in a single pass, which would be amazing. That's the goal one day, <laughs> but um, so you know we provide our comments, send it back to you. You work on it, send it back to us, and it's kind of just goes back and forth in that process until everything has been resolved. And at that point we kind of prepare your offering document get you ready to file with the SEC, and then at that point you can go live basically instantly. During the start engine review process itself, um, just to give you guys an idea of what is important. Um, so basically there are a couple main things. You know, There's a lot of tiny things, but from a conceptual standpoint, these are the major things that we're looking out for. The first is that you have all the disclosures covered and that you know it, it, the information you've provided is adequate. The second is kind of making sure that the information you're reporting is consistent throughout the uh, document. So you know whether your financials match your cap table, match your financial highlights, match your story page. It's kind of cross-checking to make sure that everything's being reported properly. Beyond that, it's um, basically making sure that your legal documents match what you're saying and your financial statements match what you're saying. And also, I think beyond. Outside of like those technical things, the largest thing we're looking for is that there are nothing misleading within the campaign. We don't want to kind of say anything exaggeratory or fraudulent or anything like that. And also, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we validate a lot of the material claims within the campaign. So with that, I just kind of listed what we generally see as the most frequent problems when you get into the review process for Star Engine crowdfunding uh, campaigns. So, you know, our two largest problem areas, I would say, are always the legal documents and the financial statements and how they kind of correlate to the offering terms. Some of the most frequent we see in, in regards to the terms is whether, you know, there's problems with what you want to offer versus what your legal documents actually allow you to offer, whether you have the, enough shares authorized, whether you have the class you're saying authorized, um, or whether you've actually created that class that you're saying that you have. Um, beyond that, they're the financial statements, we generally see a lot of, um, you know, this is when you try to prepare it yourself for the most part, um, which obviously is a cheaper option but more difficult. You know, sometimes they'll cover the wrong period, sometimes the statements will not flow through properly. And then another larger one we see is the, what I mentioned before, is if you have previously been operating as a company and then you reincorporate for the crowdfunding, but it's the same business and you're just transferring assets, that's what count, what's called a predecessor company. And that means that the financial statements 
still have to cover the last two years of that company because it's the same business operating, basically. So you can't just create a new company, move everything, and have no financials to do. Um, aside from that, valuation, we get a lot of questions. Um, and then um, there's a lot of exaggeratory stuff, uh, unsubstantiated projections, and um, misleading statements about the investment. So we try to limit. Those are the key things that the SEC will kind of highlight that you want to stay away from, whether it be projections that are unsubstantiated or kind of talking about your investment in terms that make it sound better than it actually is. You always want to be very fact-based when you talk about things like that. Um, I'm not sure if, what kind of other things you run into. Uh, one tip I always have for people who are, when you're first drafting is uh, use words like we believe and we intend, you know, and so not we are the only one, but we believe we are the only one. Uh, you know, so so don't overstate things and and base it, you know if it's not a fact if it's your opinion make it clear that that's what it is and you need, still need to have a reasonable basis for it you know I, I'm God you know doesn't work well maybe I don't know um, but um, but so that's that's you know it's the same thing you should do in your your de pitch decks anything you're doing you know go reread it and see you'll you'll find a statement in there odds are just you know tone it down a little bit we believe we intend. Our goal, we intend, you know, it's because it, you can't be sure. Aside from actually going through the process, there are some sort of legal considerations once you're actually alive to make note of, uh, especially, um, I, you know, I don't know exactly. I'm sure the reggae rules are a little bit different than the CF rules, but these are kind of the three main considerations after you've actually launched that you kind of have to be aware of early on and as you go into the process. The first is making amendments to your campaign. Basically, you want to get everything right on launch because if you want to change something after you've launched, you have to file an amendment. And if it's a material amendment, which is very kind of like a loose gray area word that is defined as would it impact an investor's decision to make an investment, you can almost always make an argument for that. If it's considered a material investment, what you have to do to make that change is file it and then go back to all your investors who have already invested and have them reconfirm their investment. So it's something you want to avoid and almost without fail, every time someone does an amendment, there is some sort of drop off, whether it be because they didn't get the email or they, this gave them a reason to change their mind. So that's certainly something you want to avoid. Uh, aside from the amendments during your campaign, there's also, um, because this is a SEC regulated campaign, there are, marketing guidelines that you need to follow. I think the largest one is kind of, it's a strange rule, I'm not sure why it exists, but you can't mix advertisements that contain terms of your offering with information that is not related to your terms. So you can't say the price per share of your offering and then talk about what your company does. It's a very strange rule, but it exists. Um, so generally you want to exclude terms from most of your advertising material. The only time that you'll want to include it is if it is a terms only advertisement, which is basically just like, we have a campaign, this is our price, this is our valuation, this is what security you get, this is the link to go invest. Um, beyond that, just generally, same as your campaign, you don't wanna have any misleading information included in your marketing materials. Misleading information anywhere is kind of the largest thing that will get you in trouble, especially if it's kind of egregious or it looks like you're trying to fleece investors. Um, and then, obviously, no speculation about the likelihood of return because you really have no idea. And the real reality is that most companies at this stage are extremely risky. Um, and then finally, from an ongoing reporting standpoint, if you do successfully raise money you're, through crowdfunding, you're required to file an annual report updating investors what has happened over the course of the previous year. This is basically just the same offering document you provided with updates for the year, but it does have to be filed with SEC and posted publicly on your website. And you know, it, a, lot of, a lot of companies I've talked to who are considering crowdfunding, this is an important fact to be aware of. Um, beyond that, there are kind of, this is required to go on f until there's like four or five criteria that allow you to terminate your annual reporting. But until one of those occur, basically this is a requirement. And if you don't do it, you kind of blow the exemption and may be able to get into trouble. Um, I think that's it. Um, I have, have anything to add? I have a question for you that I think others might be interested in. Uh, so with Reggae Plus, the marketing rules are, are actually nominal. Well, there really aren't any. You can't lie, those sorts of things. But you, you, can, you could take out a page in the New York Times and advertise your offering. 
With Reg CF, uh, those sorts of communications outside of the portal have to be limited, right? So like, and your conversations with investors about specific terms, those need to come through the portal, don't they? So the advertisements are not restricted in terms of the channel of sending them, as long as it's one way. But any, basically the main restriction about CF communications is that all the information that is available to any investor should be available to all investors. So that means that communications have to be handled through the platform and basically the comment section. So if someone finds you have a campaign, sends you an email asking you questions, you basically have to redirect them to the page and tell them to ask you in the comments, and then you answer them in the comments so that everyone who's investing has access to equal information. And that's not just, that's not Start Engine's rule, it's the law. So, um, so the, it, and it's kind of cool. I mean, if you go look at it, you can, you know, an offering that's pending on their portal, you can see the questions that have been asked and the answers. So the idea is the crowd, uh, wisdom is shared uh, with the crowd. And so it's, it's a really interesting aspect of the CF, but it's something to keep in mind that is different um, in terms of crowdfunding. You're not just out there just, you know, blasting the world with your message. You, you do need to be careful in, in how you do it. And of course, they can offer some, some help with that. But. I think another interesting part of that also is that kind of by effect, you get crowdsourced due diligence on the company. So whatever amount we do on your company, someone else out there finds something, everyone gets to see it. Thank you. Um, I have a software and I have two questions. As I went up the learning curve, I thought there was something specific about 500 investors triggering like additional reporting but I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right number or if I invented that in my mind. And secondly, on the disclosures, like say today I don't have any partnership agreements and we crowdfund and say I raise $450,000 on your platform and then nine months from now I do a partnership deal with a channel partner. Is that something that then is subsequently disclosed in an annual statement or is that sort of just off to the side because it didn't occur, it didn't exist before the offering? So um, I don't believe that 500 triggers any additional reporting requirements. I think there may be, but I'm not positive what the number is, so I don't want to quote it up here. Um, I can follow up with you after the conference if you're interested. And then to speak to the second part, if you know anything that happens after the campaign, you would want to, you know, if it's material, you would want to disclose it in your annual report the subsequent year. You're also we allow you to push updates to your commu investor community which you can use, if it happens during your campaign, you can post it as an update. If it happens in the future, basically, the company is the one responsible for what they're reporting in a form, uh, an annual report. We don't kind of do validation on what you're reporting, so it's kind of your liability, but yes, you would, if, if, in terms of like validating the contracts, but yes, that is something that you would want to report, and I would think that would be a good, good thing to report. Yeah, I just wonder if the counterparty doesn't want the publicity yeah, well, that is something you and them need to work out and make sure that they're okay with you publicizing. I just have a quick question. Will your presentation be available anywhere on the website? Yes, I have been told that we're emailing it after the conference, and I will badger them to make sure that happens. Thank you. What are the implications of accepting international investment? Um, I'm, we allow it. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what they are unless you, you know, I think it's kind of up to the company whether or not they want to. I think a challenge is, is if you're marketing it internationally. So uh, if, you, if you intentionally start to market in another country, then you're subject to that country's rules. Just like if a company, if a company that's based in France were to market here to U.S. citizens, they're subject to our rules. But if somebody just happens to find out about you and comes in from another country, you know, Pretty good. <laughs> um, just to kind of follow up on that question. Um, so we were founded in Beijing, um, but we're a Delaware a C Corp, like, you know, registered here and everything. So potentially a lot of investors and, and um, you know, funds might come from international markets. So is that something that Start Engine, like, helps with, like, in terms of that legal or, like, helping through that console of that investment or is that yeah. something we got to get ourselves? So we, the platform is enabled to accept international investments if you mean from a um, execution standpoint. There's no, I don't think there's any additional work that needs to be done. 
Um, we don't do any marketing internationally, to my knowledge, but certainly from an execution standpoint, it's set up to be through the platform without any additional requirements. Uh, just to add to that, just because like we're in my mind, like we just ran a, a Facebook campaign where you know organically connected with over a million people in India. We want to leverage <coughs> to get these people to invest because our product is for India. If you get what I mean. Yeah, I mean. If they want to invest and the company's here and it's on our platform, they can log into the site and invest through the platform. Yeah, I don't, we don't have any issues with that. There could be some legal concerns uh, from the foreign perspective in that kind of situation where you maybe have now a, a Facebook campaign to go with your CF offering and you're, you're essentially intentionally sending this information out to people you're connected with in particular geographies. Right. It would be worth at least a quick consult with an attorney, I would say, if, if that's if you're if you're pulling in a decent amount of money from China or India um, or Hong Kong, um, that it is it's worth checking. Okay. Thanks. So, if a company has multiple revenue streams and they're spinning off a new company, um, I know you mentioned that you need to uh, show historical financials. Does that include financials that don't pertain to the core business uh, that's the subject of the crowdfund? Um, for us, that generally that comes down to kind of a case by case analysis and like pretty detailed look at the facts, uh, and that there can kind of that can kind of go two routes depending on what the facts are. One being if it was a very substantial business line that was operating for a long time that it would be a predecessor company and you would need those financials. The second being if the other company was acting as an incubator and not really, it wasn't really in there a long time and then it was spun out of the company from being incubated and started as a new entity that would not need the financials. So both scenarios are possible and it would kind of require a more thorough analysis. Sure, that makes sense. And, and then, with regard to exaggerating projections, um, like, are there best practices around how to benchmark and create projections that um, are not considered uh, outlandish? I mean, obviously, you can look at similar companies' growth within your industry, the industry size, um, but but like, how do you, how do you sort of not cross that line? Um, so I will say that the number one thing that will lead to litigation is forward-looking projections. So we try to kind of suggest against it, and if you are insistent, we will allow it under very strict guidelines with kind of like disclaimers about the statements, and we'll have to validate the actual financial model, and you'll have to disclose all the assumptions you made, and not only the assumptions, but why you believe you'll be able to achieve them with kind of... Um, benchmarks for, you know, I believe I'll be able to reach this assumption because our competitor is currently doing this, these numbers, fact-based assumptions. Um, I think that's kind of the main ballpark. I don't know if you have that. Well, yeah, I'm curious. Um, uh, we run, this is really great question. This is a common challenge to figure out. So for instance, um, someone says, we believe we will triple our growth of sales within three years. And so we would turn that into, uh, we believe that the market for, all of these kinds of products is, you know, three billion dollars, and we aim to achieve, you know, ten percent market, um, and you know, it, and even then, I, that might cross the line for you guys. Um, and so, I would definitely say I keep forward projections out of both Reg A plus and CF, unless there's something really clear cut there to go on. Yeah, that's very helpful. I appreciate it. I saw like a, a, a campaign recently, and their projections look crazy and it just it just really uh, struck a nerve so so i can appreciate where you're coming from there it doesn't do you any good right you know it turns out uh, a real investor just yeah managing expectations is really important um so they've waved us off said that we're out of time if you want to ask questions you can come ask us up front of course um but they told us to end it so thank you everyone and we appreciate you joining